Greetings, I'm Richard Marks, an Associate Professor of Orthopedic Surgery here at the Medical College of Wisconsin and also the Director of the Division of Foot and Ankle Surgery. Today we're going to go over examination of the foot and ankle. This is an exam that should be done both in a standing position, uh, watching the patient ambulate, uh, as well as in a seated position. The first portion of the examination is performed with the patient standing. This allows us to assess any angular deformity which may be coming from the hips, knees, or the ankle or midfoot. Following this assessment, the patient is then asked to turn around and place his or her hands on the wall. This allows us to assess for uh, any hind foot angular deformity. Next, we have the patients go up and down on their toes. And in patients that have normal subtail or motion, you will see inversion of the heel when they go up on their toes. Next, the patient is asked to isolate one foot and go up and down on that foot. In a patient with a pathologic flat foot deformity, typically from arthritis or from posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, we will have failure of inversion of the heel. In this patient, however, this is a normal exam. Additionally, it's useful to uh, watch the patient ambulate in the hall. We're checking for any uh, limp, any leg length uh, discrepancy, and normal gait progression. The examination of the foot and ankle is a systematic exam, and we need to evaluate any skin changes, uh, the vascular system, motion of the ankle and foot, motor function, and take advantage of the fact that uh, you can perform a bilateral exam in order to determine abnormal from normal. In addition, we're going to briefly describe a regional foot and ankle exam that will help differentiate different pathologies of the foot and ankle. Initially, uh, one should uh, examine uh, the skin for any dystrophic changes, also the presence or absence of hair. Patients that uh, do not have uh, hair in their lower leg and foot may uh, have vascular insufficiency. There are two pulses that need to be checked with the vascular exam. The first is the dorsalis pedis, uh, which is uh, typically found uh, just medial or lateral uh, to the extensor hallucis longus uh, tendon in the mid portion of the foot. Uh, the second pulse is the posterior tibial pulse, which is found in the tarsal canal, just posterior to the medial malleolus. Approximately 10% of patients will uh, have an absence of the dorsalis pedis uh, pulse. Uh, the next exam entails evaluating motion of the foot and ankle, and this is where bilaterality uh, comes into play. First exam is checking uh, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the ankle. The second exam is uh, testing subtalar range of motion. And this is best performed by stabilizing the distal tibia and cupping the heel and gently inverting and everting the subtalar joint. There will be abnormal subtalar motion in patients that have uh, arthritis or a congenital tarsal coalition. Additionally, one can check transverse tarsal motion, which involves motion between the talonavicular and calcaneocuboid joints. And this is best done by stabilizing the hind foot and then gently uh, internally rotating and externally rotating the transverse tarsal joint. The tarsometatarsal junction uh, can then be isolated by stabilizing the midfoot and then placing sagittal stress of the respective five rays. So one can test uh, the medial column or the first ray, the middle columns which entail the second and third rays, and the lateral column which involves the fourth and fifth rays. Any hypermobility associated with the first ray may be associated with a flat foot deformity and pes plantar valgus. Additionally, patients that have had a midfoot injury, otherwise known as a list franc injury, will also have tenderness with this exam, as well as patients with 
symptomatic midfoot arthrosis. The remaining um, uh, range of motion exam entails uh, checking uh, the motion of the hallux and the lesser toes. Lastly, motor function uh, is assessed. Uh, the principal uh, motor units of the anterior compartment consist of the tibialis anterior and the extensor hallucis uh, longus. The uh, tibialis anterior is uh, isolated by dorsiflexing uh, the ankle and resisting that motion. And this travels along the anterior aspect of the ankle and then inserts at the uh, medial cuneiform and first metatarsal base. The EHL is best tested by having the patient uh, dorsiflex the hallux and then resisting this. Any uh, abnormality of, of either one of these uh, tendons uh, will cause a patient to have a sensation of slapping at the foot as they uh, attempt to ambulate. Additionally, the anterior compartment musculature can be involved in uh, neuromuscular disorders such as Charcot-Marie Tooth. The posterior compartment, uh, which uh, principally plantar flexes uh, the foot, is assessed by having the patient plantar flex uh, their foot and then resisting that. And the superficial posterior compartment uh, is uh, principally involves the Achilles tendon. The deep posterior compartment, which uh, involves the flexor hyacinth longus, the posterior tibial tendon, uh, and the FDL tendon uh, can be tested uh, by isolating uh, these tendons as well. For the posterior tibial tendon, ask the patient to plantar flex their foot and then invert the foot. This will allow us to isolate the posterior tibial tendon as it comes behind the medial malleolus and inserts on the naviculum. Some patients that have posterior tibial tendon dysfunction will attempt to overpower the dysfunctional posterior tibial tendon with the tibialis anterior. So in those patients, we ask them to plantar flex and evert the foot and then invert the foot. And this better isolates the posterior tibial tendon. The everters uh, of the foot, principally uh, the perineals as well as the uh, perineus uh, tertius, are best isolated by having patients plantar flex and evert the ankle. And as we can see, if we internally rotate here, uh, the perineals are nicely isolated. The perineus brevis comes behind the lateral malleolus underneath the extensor retinaculum and then inserts on the uh, base of the fifth metatarsal. The perineus longus travels uh, just posterior to this and travels in a groove at the base of the cuboid to insert on the plantar aspect of the first metatarsal. So this not only everts but it also tends to plantar flex the first ray. Next we're going to discuss a regional examination of the foot and ankle. There are numerous uh, structures uh, throughout the foot and ankle, so it's quite helpful if we can isolate these into regions. First, we're going to evaluate the posterior heel. The differential diagnosis for posterior heel pain consists of Achilles tendon disorders, calcaneal fracture, Haglund's deformity, which is a prominent lateral calcaneal tuberosity, retrocalcaneal bursitis, Ostrigonum uh, syndrome or posterior uh, heel impingement, as well as flexor hallucis longus tenosynovitis. Achilles tendon pathology can be in the non insertional portion as well as the insertional portion uh, of the Achilles. Patients with insertional Achilles tendinopathy will have point tenderness. Uh, directly posterior at the insertion on the inferior calcaneal tuberosity. If there is any question of possible Achilles tendon rupture, one typically finds a gap which is about two to six centimeters proximal to the insertion. If there is uh, any question as to whether or not a patient has ruptured, we will then examine them in a prone position on the examining table with the knees dorsiflexed. 
In this position, what we do is squeeze the posterior calf. In this patient, we see that the Achilles tendon is intact, and this creates passive plantar flexion uh, of the foot. Uh, in the presence of a rupture, squeezing the posterior calf will not create plantar flexion. Additionally, we ask the patient with a suspected uh, rupture uh, to uh, bend their knees. And if we see any excessive dorsiflexion uh, compared to the contralateral uninvolved side, this connotes a Achilles tendon rupture.